ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome back to Adherent First and 15 by our association, Nasasano. Today, our guest is going to be uh, Dr. Jacopo Dallan, who is uh, mainly involved in uh, amazing activities in uh, um, skull-based surgery and uh, um, ENT. His um, topics today, he's going to talk about uh, some of the new uh, approaches um, through our corridors, uh, such as uh, the eye, uh, to the skull base, uh, but uh, using the eye as a corridor. Um, Jacopo Dallan is um, a renowned surgeon, also involved in uh, some uh, research, and uh, he's uh, one of the uh, contributor and uh, writer of the, uh, an amazing book about the surgical anatomy of the internal carotid artery um, with uh, Professor Castelnuovo and Manfred Chabichar. Good morning, uh, uh, Dr. Dalan. Good morning. Um, Good thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm really glad about uh, to, about your participation to our activities. Uh, this is the first, this is the first uh, um, time that, that we are going to talk about uh, the eye as uh, uh, for some pathologies, but not not only pathologies, but also as a corridor. Um, the, the topic of today is going to be briefly summarized in a few steps and uh, he will describe uh, and show some uh, uh, presentation and videos. So we briefly uh, introduced you and would you like to please uh, uh, start your presentation? Thank you so much, of course. Uh, thank you to, uh, to everyone. Uh, it's a little bit strange. Uh, just to have a talk in this way, but I think that uh, it's uh, it's future, and uh, we have to to start to 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 imagine that there are several ways to communicate. So I feel that it's a great occasion, and I think that Dr. Puja Degani has uh, has a great merit to push this uh, this kind of activity. So I would say that uh, thank you for involving me there in this in this project and. Um, Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, this kind of uh, approach, I would say, this kind of idea. Um, and I, I would say that um, it's not a complete uh, an idea of mine. I have uh, discussed with the other surgeons. So I, I think that it's, uh, it's not more the time to think to a, a one-man show, but to start to think really in a... In a a way in which all of us put something just to create some, some bigger and some beautiful. Uh, the idea uh, to use the orbit like a corridor, uh, it's not a, a new idea, it has been, uh, has been used in the past. And uh, talking about transorbital approach, it's by far a very huge argument. So in, the, in order to to, to go to the essential and not to talk a lot and not to, to be too complex, to be, uh, to be least and to be followed. I think that uh, it's better to reduce the, uh, the, the, the argument to, a, I would say, a part of the topic. In this respect, uh, my, my talk uh, will be uh, will be on the superior lead approach that is one of the approaches we can use through the orbit. And uh, the target point is, uh, in this case, limited to the middle cranial fossa. Um, I try and I hope at the end of uh, the discussion some good points uh, will be outlined. And uh, it's time to go. It's time to go because I started in the, in the, the lab of Manfred Schabicher in 2008, so uh, 11 years ago. And the, the picture you see are the first picture I saw passing through, a, I would say, superior lead approach. It's a right side orbit. And it was the first time for me uh, that I had the opportunity to look transorbital endoscopic assisted to the uh, superior uh, orbital fissure to uh, the orbital roof and to the tentorium when I was inside. So I was completely in a new field, in a new anatomic area with a strange perspective. So 2008. 
And uh, in this, this case, uh, uh, this was the first case I saw that make me think, okay, you can do it. Uh, it was 2011, the patient was not operated by myself, was not operated via transorbital approach, but it was the first time I realized that the orbit could be a corridor to get such a deeper area. It was uh, eight years ago. It was absolutely outside of my technical possibilities, but something in my mind was, okay, I think that it could be done. And I really had no idea if it was possible or not. But these two uh, dates, 2008 and 2011, was really significant for me. And if, and if, of course, you consider that uh, Albert Einstein said that uh, if at, at first, in the beginning, any, any, idea, any given idea is not absurd, it's not crazy, then uh, there is no hope for it. I, I mean, that is perfectly fitting with this concept, because if you think 11 years ago to start looking at the orbit, in, I would say in a very curious way, but uh, it was the period uh, uh, or the transnasal extended approaches and changing perspective was strange. So it was my story. Since that, things have changed. Uh, many people in the world have, uh, have think, have managed, have proposed something about the orbit, uh, something about uh, the idea of the orbit like a, a target area and like a corridor. That is our philosophy now in these lessons. And this person um, married um, part of the, uh, of the efforts and married all my gratitude because uh, uh, as I told you, it's not a, a, a work of a one person. It's a, it's a thing, it's a way in which we discuss. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, I would say uh, that every good idea is the fusion of different perspective and uh, discussing. So uh, Professor Castelnuovo, uh, Franceschini, Locatelli from Varese were people with which I discussed the idea, the possibility and every one of that uh, of this person uh, is absolutely part, an important, fundamental, critical part of uh, this idea. So it's not an idea of one person, it's an idea that come from other person that fuse myself, Castelnuovo, uh, Franceschini, and of course, people from other parts of the world. Fix the point. Uh, and try to be clear as possible. I would say transorbital surgery, I would say orbit as a corridor. That means sparing the periorbit. That means creating a corridor, a way to get deeper area. Because of course, uh, as, as your experience, as your patients, become more and more complex. As the pathology are multi-compartmental, of course, one way is not enough. And uh, pushing the limit of uh, a single approach, I think it's really wrong because you adapt the pathology, the patient problems to your ability. So uh, I'm, really I'm really grateful for the great opportunity I have to work with different specialists from different areas that makes me be really an open, I think, an open-minded. And uh, I do not believe the nose is the answer. I do not believe the eye is the answer. I do not believe there is no one, I don't want to say, any dogmatic word. So not to be dogmatic in any way, the orbit is a great opportunity, the nose is a great opportunity, the oral cavity is a great opportunity. So um, should you be um, scared about this? Is if my, my, my second daughter was not afraid to, without any thief, to go against a very big 
piece of bread, uh, I said, okay, I, I can go. And uh, these are the opportunities, but this is your feeling. You see a lot of things, and you say, I cannot do it. You can do it. You have to learn one step. So before start running, you have to become able to walk. So just to learn one thing, just to adapt the thing to your necessity and go on with your growing experience. So don't rely to uh, people that try to scare you about uh, one approach or the other. Be serious, but consider that you can learn as I learn and you can improve like I am improving in my personal activities. So the concept is that uh, whenever you are dealing with a superior lead approach, you have to learn just two points that there is the orbicularis oculi muscle and that there is the orbital rim. Once you are in the undersurface of the orbicularis oculi muscle, you can get the orbital rim and create your corridor, just like you see in this, I would say, small summary. So you make an incision here, you found the orbicularis oculi muscle, then you found the, the superlateral part of the orbital rim and in this way you spare the levator palpebrae muscle. I mean you have completely spared the function of, of the superior elite. That means that you can get enough space to work in a corridor between the bone and the periorbital. So Summarize to the essential. This is a sagittal portion of a superior eyelid. You see the orbicularis oculi muscle here. You see the orbital rim here, just over there. This is the tarsus. This is the system of the levator palpebrae. This is what you need to spare. It is difficult. No. Find that muscle is by far more easy in vivo situation than in a cadaveric dissection. So don't be, I would say, disappointed when you start in the lab and you don't see very well the orbicularis oculi muscle. It's by far more easy in the uh, clinical scenario. So get the undersurface of the muscle, stay on the undersurface of this flap, get the bone, and create your corridor. I, believe me, these are the two, only two points that you fix in your mind. And in this case, uh, uh, you can see how it's quite easy to find a straight way to the middle cranial force. So uh, it is the perfect solution for everything? Of course, no, it's an option. And uh, the real interesting part is that the dissection of the periorbital fascial layer, the periorbital, the periosteum, call as you want, the concept is still the same, found the uh, superolateral part of the orbital ring. So no matter the way you prefer a lead crease incision, a lateral cant, I don't want to discuss about these are details. The concept is find the bone, sparing the levator palpebrae, create your corridor to the lateral part, the bony lateral part of the orbit. You can see here it's a drawing showing the G. WS, of course, is a greater ring of the sphenoid. You see the inferior orbit create just like a triangle that makes you clearly visible the open door to the middle cranial fossa, to the cavernous side, the inferior orbit of fish structure. So this is the topic and the target. Of course, the target are if you want to go to the anterior cranial fossa, but it's not the, the item of this discussion, you see that you can control the undersurface of the lateral part of the frontal lobe. But 
given the fact that we are dealing in this lesson with the middle cranial force approach, so the region of the temporal lobe, the region of the lateral lobe, the cavernous sinus, the Meckel's cave region, you see in the red dot circle the approach or the target of the approach. So just to make you uh, see what I uh, had the opportunity, that video is coming from the lab, lab of Barcelona uh, from 2012. So it's a seven years old video and I put because it's part of my story and uh, you can see orbit. You have the superior orbital fissure just over there. The middle cranial fossa could be completely exposed, it can be completely exposed. And it's a, an in vivo situation, is a cadaveric dissection, and the, the black arrow is pointing a very important structure that I will show you later, that is the meningo orbital vein. But as I told you, too much words can be confusing. So fix your point in the palpable work and the point related to the bony part find your superior and inferior orbital fissure and then go on with the work. So again, like Latin said, repetita juvent, you see it's a left side, so the MCFD is a middle cranial fossa dura, as the floor of the middle cranial fossa, you see the temporalis muscle, the inner surface of the temporalis muscle just over there, and this is our target to go to the middle cranial fossa. So again, you see, in the anterior cranial fossa here, you see in a middle cranial fossa here, and if you drill down and expose the middle fossa floor here, you can see exactly the uh, epetrus apex, the uh, V3 coming down from the foramen ovale, but these details are probably too much, and I want to focus the point to the middle cranial fossa approach, that is this kind of approach. So again, uh, left side here. So the meningo orbital band here, it's the superior orbital fissure just over there. You see an intradural vision of the, uh, this kind of approach in a cadaver. The TL is for temporal lobe. It's LWCS, uh, it's a lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, but have a look in this part. So have a look to, you see my pointer? Okay, so the red circle, the red ellipse is going in an intradural exploration. The black is pointing out what is called an interdural exploration, interdural dissection of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. That is an, a typical approach that the interdural space neurosurgeon do passing laterally. In this case, the position of the meningo orbital band make the dissection of the two layers of the dura, of the cavernous sinus, much easier and probably very useful for selected approach to the lateral wall and the Meckel's cave. So, uh, reducing, reducing the, the amount of information and trying to point and, and repeat the same concept back to the essential. So have a look to the approach. No matter the way, uh, bigger or uh, smaller, you create your approach, you see the orbicularis oculi muscle, found the under surface, reach the bone, and then create your corridor detaching the periorbita from the inner surface of the bone. So second step, so simplify to the essential. Second step, identification of the bony landmarks, that means superior orbital fissure, that means inferior orbital fissure, and have a look, it's a cadaveric dissection, superior and inferior orbital fissure, the lateral wall here, is a right side, here is a left side in the in vivo situation, but the story doesn't change because the concepts are still the same. So have a look in the dissection on their cadaver, SOF is superior orbital fissure, 
the approach for a middle cranial fossa here and here, the greater ring of the sphenoid, the uh, orbital part of the greater ring of the sphenoid represent your gateway. So superior orbital fissure, inferior orbital fissure, temporalis muscle, they create a triangle. You pass through this triangle and get the middle cranial fossa. Just to summarize, again, Manfred Schaffischer told me that there is only one anatomy, only one anatomy, and there are different ways to look at the anatomy. So I want to offer you what I learned from uh, this maestro. That means that try to fuse in your mind uh, a 3D understanding. And in this case, this is a right orbit here, greater ring of the sphenoid, expose the bone, drill the bone, expose the dura, and then have a look at what is behind. This is the first step, but I'm sure that it's something that you can do in a very easy way. It's by far more easy, and believe me or not, it's true, to dissect this kind of surgery than dissecting a lot of transnasal approaches. But of course, as in any other situation, you start, you have maybe an idea, and then you become more and more curious. You become more and more interested, and you talk with your friends, and they say it seems to be crazy or not to go on. So other people went on with a different idea. And it was a moment I said, okay, why not to go to the lateral wall? I remember a lot of discussion with my neurosurgical colleagues about the interdural approach of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. This is an endoscopic assisted transorbital dissection of the two layers of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus or go to the cilian fissure. So it is like a Pterional approach, I don't know. But the area with which we are dealing, passing through the orbit, it's by far uh, similar to the area that uh, the pterional or mini pterional approach is not my topic. Uh, it's, a, it's a field for a neurosurgeon. I think that uh, we all work together and not one against the other. So I, I do feel that uh, it is an opportunity that it's it's nice that, uh, thanks again, Puja, for your work, because it's nice to share the idea, even if, uh, and the story is going on. And probably as much as people work together, things go better. So, of course, you gain practical experience, you, your skill becomes better, uh, you feel more comfortable and start to manage the lesser wing of the sphenoid that in the beginning it's a little bit more complex to go medially to manage the uh, anterior clinoid process. And so you are moving medially. So in the beginning you are afraid of uh, opening the dura like in any other situation. But you realize that with your experience, consider that the first case is date far 2012. So uh, it's a, it's a, I would say it's a long story. It's a seven years old for me. And uh, I do feel that uh, since that uh, things are really changed and uh, now there are several groups that are using this. And in this video, it's a five, six years old video. Uh, we take down the uh, lesser ring we were in the anterior clinoid process and an extradural anterior approach to the anterior clinoid process, more or less here. And uh, of course, we can do better. It's normal. We should do better. We have to do better. But if you think that it was a uh, five, six years ago surgery, quite a complete extradural anterior clinoidectomy. So that means that you have resect lesser ring, greater ring. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting point of view. And as I told you, it's uh, an interesting point of view because uh, as I told you in the beginning, it's not a work of one person alone. So again, thanks to uh, Franceschini, that was uh, my former chief, uh, Castelnuovo and Locatelli, because this idea 
has been discussed a lot and uh, my speech is uh, I think I would say uh, that is a speech on behalf of all these uh, persons that gave a critical uh, enthusiasm, a critical improvement to this uh, idea. Everyone has put something in this in this uh, in this uh, pocket. So go inside, go inside and have a look. What is uh, the middle cranial fossa? So the dura of the right side, it was one of the first time we saw the dura. So now it seems to be, I would say, normal. But uh, in that moment, it was not the same. So I think to, to do the first, for the first time, something and to see, you know that there is something behind, but uh, whenever you see the temporal lobe from the orbit, it's not like, uh, so I, the story, the story, this is the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, and all this is the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, and all these venous bridging veins are huge. And so it's, uh, and it was a, a meningioma surgery. We did, a, I think, a good job, but we can discuss later about the indication. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Jacob. I just want to, I just want to have a question. Are you, you, you exactly say that uh, when, when you're inside and uh, if you're one of the first one to, to try this kind of approach, you don't know exactly what is uh, in front of you, okay? So how was the, the feeling and how was um, the exactly what are you uh, expecting when you're opening the dura and you know, I mean, uh, in, a, in a quite uh, expanded horizon, um, you know what is after the dura, but what's the what is in front of you, and suddenly what's happening when you open the dura in that part? Good question. The the, the answer is that uh, of course you know what is behind. You have done uh, several dissection, and uh, so you know what is behind. But uh, one thing is uh, knowing, and one thing is doing. So it's the, the question is, uh, the story is well explained about the feeling you have because you know that, okay, you think you are prepared to go there because you truly believe that is a right option for the patient. And uh, based on the grounds we have now, I can say that it, it was really a good choice. But the first, times you, the first time I opened the Dura, it was 2014, 2000, the first case, 2012, the first kind I opened the door and I saw the temporal lobe was 2014. And, uh, and of course, uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, you are expecting something and thanks God, everything was okay. But the feeling was, uh, I was, we were, uh, we were, not I was, we were absolutely excited and I would say scared. And, uh, and of course, gaining experience allows you to be more uh, calm and confident. But uh, in, in the story of every one of us, there is a moment, there is a momentum in which you decide to do, to go through the border. And uh, we were prepared because this story is not, is not born without base solid grounds but uh, i say that uh, it was excited so but the story is not finished because um, going inside this was the paper i published two years ago uh, about the transorbit approach to the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus but the the nice part that you see these are cadaveric 2012 and 2014 so there are, there are two years between the lab and the um, surgical application. But you see the lateral of the cavernous sinus, you see this venous bridging vein here, venous bridging uh, system here. It is uh, the same bridging system, connection vein, call as you want, between the uh, temporal lobe and the lateral of the cavernous sinus is a left side, left side, left side, left side. That means that you, you are expecting to find this because you have been there in the lab. But looking and 
seeing this in the in vivo situation, it's not the same, but it's part of the story. And you were here. So the idea were clear. We discussed a lot with the other parts of the group. Again, do not consider this as a lesson of Jacopo Dallan alone, but it's a lesson of the group. And uh, after that, you have to close, but differently to a transnasal approach, you have the orbit that makes like a support. So the risk of a CSF leak from the orbital incision, it's by far less important. So a multi-layer, no matter the way, Duragen or fascia, fat, I don't want to discuss about details. Have a look to the drawing I prepared. You create your opening, you put fat, you put fascia, and again fat, but the story can change. You can use different materials. I do feel that the role of the orbital content in supporting, in pushing your reconstruction makes your reconstruction by far more solid than a typical transnasal approach in which below your reconstruction you have nothing, you have air. So the story regarding the topic of the reconstruction is very, very different from a transorbital approach in respect to a pure transnasal approach. I don't want to spend too much time to the inferior extension but just to show you that uh, this is a right side, this is the temporal lobe here, and you can see here that you can go by far more posterior and see V3 coming out from the foramen ovale. So passing through the orbit, you can drill down all the floor of the middle cranial fossa and see the third branch of the trigeminal nerve passing from the foramen ovale. Again, thanks to Martin Chabisha, because the anatomy is still the same, really the same. So no matter the way you are dealing with a transnasal approach, an infratemporal approach, fish or whatsoever, or a transorbital approach, the structure are there. You have only to know that they are there and you have to find them. The, the narration is by far necessary. I don't want to discuss about other details. So, uh, how we do it? This is the story. So fix the point, palpable work, two points, orbicularis oculi muscle and orbital ring. Second point, dissect your periorbital from the inner surface of the bone. All my words can be summarized in this. Find the superior and inferior orbital fish. And how you do it, how we do it, like in any other skull base extended approach, two, three surgeons together. Uh, so working bimanually, it's a, a preferred option in my hands. I prefer to work with my two hands together. But as you can see, you can share and you should share your surgery with your colleague. You can work with the endoscope, you can work with the microscope, so no dogma, never, never be dogmatic. So thinking in only one way, it's always a limit. So this picture are taken uh, from a case, a very extended case we did, and we decide why not to use the opportunity to work with two hands with the microscope, with two hands with the endoscope, and this is my uh, neurosurgeon. I would say that you can share your part of the surgery. In this case, I hold the endoscope, other part of the surgery, I did the surgery. So consider this surgery like a team surgery. Stop, think to a one-man show. Back to some cases. I don't want to steal your time. The concept is that uh, these are the first days. This, this, this case I did in Barcelona. Uh, this was one of the cases I did with uh, my former chief. Uh, and if you have a look, I, I will skip the video because I feel that the video can have a few information. I will show you some, really some few part of the video uh, because the story is more or less the same you see before, 
But the, the interesting part of this uh, story is, uh, have a look to the post-op CT scan, and I will show you MRI. Have a look to the, the tumor that is completely invading the greater ring and the lesser ring, completely uh, pushing the superior orbital fissure and the meaning orbital band. And if you look at the post-op, you see exactly like we did quite a complete anterior extradural complete, I would say, clinoidectomy. So it's a, a typical neurosurgical procedure done transcranially, lateral, with a lateral approach. It's a very important approach for uh, the management of uh, this area and the uh, possibility to manage, in this case, extradurally, but there is no reason we can go intradurally allows you to create a very huge working corridor for different pathologies. And the combination of the nose, look at this case. So pathology in the middle fossa, pathology in the sphenoid area. It was uh, a case uh, I did with Castanuovo, a great case we did together. Uh, but uh, regarding or regardless the uh, the uh, video, what is interesting is that you can gain a very good resection and you have to consider that these cases are the first cases. I uh, prefer to show you the case, the first cases uh, we did because I do feel that uh, with growing experience with the, the increasing amount of data we, we have now, we can really talk differently about this approach. Uh, this is uh, something that I think that uh, it's time quite to, to skip, but I want to fix some points more. It's time to collect data. Probably, yes. Uh, we published uh, in neurosurgery this paper regarding spin orbital meningioma, but uh, I'm really proud that There are several other groups that have started to do to use this approach and to to expand what a high start what we started. Uh, what I want to say, I want to say that it, this was a case I did. It was the first time we go inside of the temporal loop. I will skip the video because it adds nothing, but I will show you the patient, the results was not perfect, but gives you the idea and how deep you can far inside of the temporal lobe, reaching the petrous apex and exposing the lateral hole of the cavernous sinus. The patient is in this case, so you have a great opportunity, but I'm really proud to tell you that, to, to really to show that uh, in literature are coming uh, several groups, especially one from um, South Korea, but the group of New York uh, from uh, Till Schwartz is, uh, is absolutely working on this topic. And uh, if you look at the paper they published and uh, all other papers that are coming out, you see that uh, they present at least 20 cases of uh, Meckel's cave lesion. Have a look to this uh, trigeminal schwannoma done completely transorbit. So I'm really, really proud. And um, I think that uh, uh, Duzik uh, is a friend, uh, the, all the group from South Korea has really pushed the, the border uh, and they have done a step forward and they have show, uh, I had the idea that uh, the that we can do this, but they did. And I'm, I'm really happy to show the results. And I think that next time you should invite uh, also Duzi Kong from South Korea, because uh, I, I do believe that all together, uh, and this story perfectly fits with uh, this concept, all together we can do better than uh, ourselves uh, alone. So uh, you can find a lot of uh, uh, publication from this. And uh, so from the 
first idea from the first case in 2012 now you can find i have no personally uh, i've done yet a case in the mechanscape passing through the orbit passing through the nose yes but not through the orbit but the results from uh, the south korea group are absolutely outstanding and they uh, merit uh, uh, really uh, my, my personal thank because i do believe they have done great great job what about the cosmetic results they are great the lead crease approach is absolutely nice the scar is quite uh, invisible everything is fine no everything is not fine uh, things can happen and uh, you can have bleeding very bad bleeding uh, I mean you know that uh, whenever you are facing with uh, this kind of new approach you can have uh, problems uh, you can have problems intradurally you can have problems in the approach uh, the first case you see here it was really a huge bleeding I had this unfortunate situation with Castelnuovo. I was exhausted <laughs> at the end of this. So just to tell you that uh, not everything is fine and things happen and you should be ready to face this. You should be, you should work in a team because you cannot manage everything by yourself. So I think that uh, uh, you asked me before how you feel when you open the door. Uh, you can, you know, you can have a problem, and uh, you should be ready to to face the problem, because uh, in this case, you see. Anyway, we 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 went, we managed, but the story is that something can happen. Something can happen outside the dura. Something can happen inside of the dura, like in this case, and it is not always a nice situation. Uh, the patient has no problem, but uh, this was a, an intradural bleeding, as you can see here. The patient has no problem at all, but just to show that we really be serious, honest, critic with our service, present data seriously. And uh, if an idea is working well, uh, the idea will not remain confined to your hands, but will be used by other hands and uh, the impression I have now is that uh, transorbital approach, especially for middle cranial fossa, for Meckel's cave, for lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, uh, for probably the Petrus apex is really a great opportunity. I've discussed with uh, several friends, with Matteo. It's, uh, it's a great opportunity that, uh, and my, my topic is, uh, is relating on this. I, I hope I've done uh, I've been uh, enough clear uh, because I do feel that it's a great opportunity and if uh, after this like, someone start and uh, push the limit and uh, put his data or data on this it's, it's a great it's a, it, this lesson has been has been useful what about CSF leak no CSF leak I have done big hole but the orbit is absolutely a great support for your reconstruction. So don't be afraid about CSF leak. Don't be afraid about the orbit because if you spare the periorbit, you push really few to the orbital content. Anyway, you can stop your surgery every 20, 30 minutes and relax the orbit. But if you resect the bone, it's the same story on any skull base approach resect the bone and leave the tissue so limitations i don't want to talk about limitation i think it's time to to, to finish because the, the limitation is something that uh, it's uh, there is always a limitation if you fall in love with the transorbital approach you have a problem it's an opportunity so learn to combine multi compartmental lesions calls Call for multi-portal approach. No dogma, no dogma, never. The endoscope is not against the microscope. 
uh, the transnasal approach is not against the transorbital approach. The transoral approach is another great opportunity, but there are other opportunities. So my point of reflection, of discussion is that no dogma. We are in a, I would say in a newborn period, but probably the newborn period is past, is, is over. Now probably we are quite in a preschooler period and the data start to, uh, to come. Uh, thanks to the work of uh, the South Korea group to Duzicom, uh, we are now the clear understanding that we can go. I went in the cavernous sinus and in the Meckles cave in the lab, they went in the, in the uh, surgical scenario and they did great. So we know that we can do this. And so it's a great opportunity. So modulate your approach. So never be dogmatic. Thank all these guys, Casanova, but all my residents. And for sure there is a, a long way, but I think that it's time to, to finish this presentation. I hope it, it was clear enough. Thanks Pooja again for well, your you. invitation. I, I've been really impressed for, from your enthusiasm. <laughs> We we uh, we would like to congratulate you for the amazing talk and and the cases. Um, we met e e each other many years ago. Uh, the first one was uh, with uh, during my period with Castelnuovo, and um, Jacopo was actually doing uh, um, the combined approach. Uh, we were uh, recording. Uh, you were performing the combined approach transoral and transnasally for a few different pathologies, and after that, he published the one of the uh, one of the research. Uh, we do have it's time for some questions. We do have few of them, uh, many actually. Uh, we have different accounts uh, uh, connected, so I have to just uh, pick up the good ones. And uh, we do have uh, one question from uh, from Napoli. I cannot tell you where. It's uh, one of our friends, and obviously he's uh, asking me a good questions. And what about medical legal, medical legal aspects in that field? He's asking um, who is in charge for the um, recovery. Like who? I, I guess that he was ask, actually asking the question: Who is in charge for that? The neurosurgeon, the ophthalmologist, or the ENT surgeon? Uh, in Italy, we do not have. Uh, the question is perfect, and uh, if it is coming from Naples, is for sure a great friend. I don't know who, but it's a great friend. But uh, the the question is uh, again uh, is perfect. But we. I have no uh, clear answer. I mean, uh, in Italy, we do not have a specialist like uh, I went, I go often in the Netherlands, like, uh, like they have in Netherlands for the ophthalmoplastic surgeon or the orbital surgeon. So uh, no one is in charge or everyone is in charge. So the concept is that if we are a team, huh, and we decide to go through this way, uh, the responsibility is of the team. So it's, uh, of course, you can try to call your uh, ophthalmologist, but most of the time in Italy, you do not have a great interest in this. Uh, having said that, uh, one of the most important part is a clear discussion with the patient, but we are not talking about a common cold. In this case, we are talking about a, a critical pathology with uh, important implications and with a natural history. So regardless of the way, going in the Meckles cave or in the greater ring of the sphenoids could be dangerous for the patients uh, regardless of the approach. So I do feel that uh, if we are a team, the responsibility is of the team, uh, probably one of the surgeon is in charge of the approach, but uh, as as the team grows, this differentiation, this division is becoming less evident. So you do one part and the other guy do the other, but you can change your, the role are interchangeable. The, you can manage different parts of the surgery. So, uh, 
dealing with such complex disease is uh, absolutely something that is complex and uh, complication are can be expected it is not possible to think not to have problems or complication in this kind of uh, surgery it's not possible professor draft said and we all need to thank him for his words that the only one that has no complication is the one that do not does not operate so i feel that uh, uh, considering the pathology the natural history of the pathology if you have a growing sphenoid wind meningioma going to the optic canal the, the patient has as a natural history of uh, suffering of the vision so we have really clear discuss about this but uh, I do feel that all the team, the several doctors involved are responsible for that. Sure. Uh, it's uh, time for the two questions. The, the, the second one, which I know exactly what he's talking about, is uh, from Emirates. And he's asking us, uh, what are you using for uh, displacing the orbit? This is a good question because um, you you manage you, you explain that very well not in this topic but uh, in the lab last time. Uh, would you please explain what are you using for displacing that? Uh, normally we use a retractor, the malleable retractor that can use with uh, or not. It's up to you uh, with a silastic sheet in order to cover and protect the uh, periorbita. So whenever we are dealing with a very orbital sparing approach. The concept is that sparing the periorbital allows you not to have fat inside of your surgical field, and a malleable retractor is enough to take your orbital content away from your instrument. Consider the fact that the approach is gained inside of the bone of the greater ring of the sphenoid. So as a matter of fact, the pressure on the orbital content is really limited because you are not pushing the orbital content from its natural position. You are simply creating space lateral to the orbital content. So the story, I know that uh, it's, uh, it seems to be scaring but the story it's in this way you are not displacing your orbital content from the natural position you are gaining space removing bone that means that at the end of surgery if you have not managed and damaged too much the periorbita the appearance of the eye is i don't want to say perfect but do not Imagine to have just like a panda high or something like this. That means that a simple retractor or the by the assistant, uh, in this way you can decide to uh, stop uh, every 30 minutes. I don't want to say do 10 hour surgery without uh, removing your retractor, but it's uh, a little bit easy much more than people think to manage the orbital content away from the instrument great so you actually already answered to the other question and that was exactly how's the eyeball exp um, appearance after surgery before surgery and you completely um, uh, answer to that it question depends, too. it depends it depends on how you damage the periorbit exactly. the real noble part of this situation is the orbital content. Whenever you do not transgress the periorbita, believe me, the orbit appearance after surgery is not, I don't want to say perfect, but you don't have to think to any traumatic situation. If you go inside, the, the disease is inside of the periorbita, things change dramatically. Completely a different story, but in a periorbita sparing approach, the appearance of the orbit is uh, I would say good enough and I would advise to uh, have a look to the uh, illa, to the eye, uh, 
sometimes during surgery, if you have a good relationship with an ophthalmologist, take this guy with you because it's perfect, but it's not so easy to have this kind of nice collaboration. I would say that I, that I'm lucky enough, but I really believe that we need a stronger, stronger, stronger collaboration with ophthalmologist, neurosurgeon, maxillofacial surgeon, uh, and so on, a radiologist. Um, this is also, I think that the periorbit sparing thing is very good also because if you're, you are avoiding any involvement of the muscle. So they are asking me, uh, what's, what about the, the movement? And actually, you already uh, answered to the question because you are sparing the periorbit. So that means that no muscular activity will be affected. So this is, Absolutely. This is very Absolutely. good. Absolutely not. The real, the real risk, if, if we want to be completely clear about too much details, I think, for a lesson, but the real risk you have in this kind of approach is a risk related to the vascularization of the central retinal artery that in some case can be related to the branches of the middle meningeal artery. There is a connection passing to the greater, I will... You see my picture? You yes. see my picture again? Yeah. Okay, I want to show one thing. I want to show one thing that it's the explanation of my words now. And it, I think it's the really most important things in this story. Uh, maybe it was in the beginning. Okay, we are close to the, 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 okay, have a look at this. Yes. This black arrow show you, this is a superior orbital fissure, it's the right side, it's the greater ring of the sphenoid. This is a recurrent arterial vessel connecting the intraorbital system, mostly the lacrimal artery, but not only, with the meningo, with the middle meningeal artery. In some situation, this artery is the main feeder of the central retinal artery. This is well known from the angiographic literature. And this is a possible explanation of a severe damage of the visual activity in this patient related to the fact that performing the approach and drilling down this and managing this connecting arterial branch, recovered lacrimal artery, whatsoever, this foramen is called Hirtle foramen, is present in more or less 60% of the cases, but these details are meaningless. The concept, the real concept is that if you damage this artery and you are unlucky and you have no chance to, to know this pre-op, and you are unlucky, the patient can wake up with a severe damage of his her visual activity because this branch could be, could be, and we don't know in which patient, could be the main feeder of the central retinal artery. That is the terminal branch of the optic nerve. That means if you damage this, you go to a complete or partial morosis or a severe visual impairment. This is the real problem we have. Based on the data acquired here in PISA, uh, not only for this kind of approach, but also for Graves' disease, I can tell you that is really, a, really an, an uncommon situation. So you have not to be afraid about this. But the problem of the muscle of the damage of the muscle is, I would say, simply not existing because you spare the periorbital, the muscle, the remain covered and repaired by any injury. The real limit is that in a very unknown percentage of case, the damage of this vessel, this connection between the external and internal uh, carotid system can result in a severe damage to the uh, vision of the patient.
I don't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was muting because of uh, to to let to let you more clear. I think that you covered the whole uh, the whole uh, complication, the whole uh, anatomy, the the critical point, uh, the tips and pitfalls for the for such surgery. Uh, we don't have many many colleagues right now. Unfortunately, we have to to conclude this uh, this topic. I would like also. Um, to have a few different uh, specialists around the world connected for a ground rounds about this topic, I will for sure invite. Uh, the, Would be great. Yes, I, w I will. I will. I will. I would like to to create uh, uh, such a like. Um, like a spider between different uh, uh, colleagues uh, with the with the uh, with the team from uh, uh, also uh, from um, from South Korea from Korea and uh, we will discuss more about that. Oh, we we basically right now have uh, Doctor Johnny Graham uh, live connected video connected. I'm sorry for that uh, because uh, he was part previously of the of the um, of some topics uh, so. Uh, he can be able to attend also the video. Master. <laughs> um, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Janik Ram, we have to conclude the, the topic. Uh, the for all the for all the um, attendees, the next uh, uh, the next lesson will be probably scheduled for uh, Professor Agaki from uh, the. Um, from the Iaki, unfortunately, she wasn't able to attend previously, but uh, we will try to do our best to make her uh, attend the next one. Uh, however, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to, to Jacopo for this amazing talk. The next appointment is uh, set up for the for the 15th of uh, of, uh, of the of April of this month once again uh, with our adherent uh, first and fifteen and uh, the next topic uh, is going to be with the Dr. Uh, Sampa Chandra Prasad Rao from India and, and he will talk about uh, some uh, uh, internal carotid arteries anatomy from the from a lateral point of view not only from the frontal. Thank you again, Jacopo, for attending this. Uh, for this uh, adherent first and 15, and I would like to express my gratitude from the association as a Thank you so much. Which, bye bye. Which you are part of it right now, actually. Thank you again, and uh, see you at 15 of April. See you. Bye.